Let me say that uh, the Lake Washington Basin Foundation is a non-partisan, non-profit, uh, environmental group. Uh, been around for about 25 years. Uh, you guys may recognize a uh, logo now. We just recently re rebuilt the light and passed that West End. Uh, welcome everyone to come out there in the museum and learn more about the lake and what we're doing out there. Come on out and see us. Uh, the comments I want to make tonight are, are scientific or technical. Uh, I'm not trying to make any kind of legal judgment on this. Uh, the uh, you know, other authorities, I guess, to, to decide. So I'll try and uh, make that clear as the presentation goes forward. Uh, I, I would try to add some detail to the, uh, the introduction that was given about this relationship of, of uh, loss of our wetlands and our vulnerability to hurricane, storm, damage, or, or risk. So uh, with that introduction, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. Now uh, this is a map that was produced of uh, flooding in New Orleans and the blue area uh, shows the area that was inundated by various storms. In 1915 hurricane was a famous hurricane. Uh, it didn't name hurricanes back then. Uh, 47, 65, you can see the area increasing now it's flooded, flooding in the city and then of course in 2005 the hurricane Katrina. And unfortunately you can see that there was an increase in mortality also with uh, uh, and over 1,400 people that were killed, unfortunately, by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, this is kind of, a, I guess, one of the bottom line kind of things in terms of our risk. And as uh, you'll see in a moment, you know, this crisis is not over. Uh, although we're aware of the flood detection system that was rebuilt around the world, we're still in, in the middle of a deep crisis that relates to our vulnerability to hurricanes. The next slide. This is a graph that I like to show to depict exactly that. It's, it's uh, a little bit complex, but it's, it's, uh, I think it really illustrates some very important points. If you kind of just bear with me, I'll try and walk you through it. On the bottom axis, going across the bottom, is, is time. So you see 1860 on the left, going out into the future, 2100. Uh, Hurricane Katrina is kind of in the middle there, uh, in that red bar, uh, in 2005, of course. So that's just time on that axis. On the vertical axis, is basically our protection level that we had with higher level of protection, the number of protection from larger, bigger storms, higher up on that scale. And so that dashed red line is basically how our flood protection dropped from being very high in the past to something lower as it was in Katrina and, and even now. And the reason that happened was um, back in the turn of the century, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, we still had a robust coast. Uh, we had forests, we had uh, cypress swamps, uh, it had extensive marsh, and that green line you see is the decline of our wetlands for that time period. Uh, so that, that is a factor. Uh, the other factor is, is the yellow line here that's uh, kind of the bottom uh, left. And that is basically made some unwise choices in terms of where we live. We, we moved into lower areas. We also start building houses slab on grade. We weren't living in our traditional houses, which was elevated. The combination of those things put us in that, that very vulnerable situation with Hurricane Betsy came. At that point, we didn't really have significant levees around the city. We had housing out as well. We, we had begun to lose our coats. Uh, and those cumulative things caught up with us. So when Betsy came, uh, of course we saw the flooding that you just saw, uh, Congress immediately authorized the levee system. And that little bar in the very bottom of the middle is the levee that was built, uh, depicting the level of protection that was afforded by that levee system. So you can see that the, the scale on the left goes from zero to 100. Uh, that levee, you know, in hindsight, after Katrina, they realized it was never completed, it was not fully designed, and it never reached even a 100 year level of protection. And it was actually authorized, the level of protection was actually authorized by Congress, was equivalent to Hurricane Betsy, like a two or three hundred year level. So you can see that it, it, this illustrates how vulnerable we were, obviously, in hindsight now, with Katrina. This levy system was, was not designed, uh, even at a very low standard. So when Katrina came, essentially, the system fell apart. The, the response after that 
was what was called the Task Force Forest Guardian. And that's where the Corps came out right after the storm and basically patched the holes in the system. Uh, didn't improve the whole system, they just plugged the holes that had, had breached. They did that within a year, and then after that they had Task Force Hope. And what Task Force Hope did is brought it up, theoretically, I think it probably is, to a 100 year level of protection. Okay, and that's what we have now in terms of the levels. And the point here, of course, is that what we were offered by that was at a three or four hundred year level, basically equivalent of that system. So, although we've been improved, probably have a better protection than we've had in decades. It's still much less than what was originally authorized by Congress, and it is less than what probably a large cosmopolitan city like New Orleans should have. Uh, and in fact, this is recognized. So you can see that red line continuing in the future, it has a line, national line, that goes up to a 400 year or 500 year line. And the Corps had a plan that they released the LACPR which basically proposed something like a 400 year or trio level of protection for the city of New Orleans. And the state master plan that was released that was approved in 2012 also recommended a four or 500 year level of protection for the city of New Orleans. And so we have a long way to go. Now the question is, how do we go from where that task force hope is up to that dash line where the LACPR is? How do we get up to that high? And basically what both agencies have embraced is this multiple lines of defense. And that is basically the vision of how we, we try to go forward. So um, let's go down to the next slide. And this is basically the concept of multiple lines of defense. So basically, we're basically throwing out everything early with it, the, you know, with the kitchen sink, you know, to try and address storm surge. We're using our natural coast, you know, try to use it in a smart way, everything from the dairy islands, the ridges, the marsh, our levees. Uh, inside the levee, we still elevate our home because we realize that it's still going to be flooding inside the levee. And then, of course, on the far right, last resort is to evacuate. And really, that's the only thing that protects people. So this idea is the multiple lines of defense. The, the lower slide, the red prism you see there, is basically how, in a very diagrammatic way, how surge moves in. And what happens is that surge moves in. As the water comes in on the coast, that landscape is resistant and it slows the water down. It slows the water down, there's less time for the water to come up. You know, hurricanes are really transient events. So if you can slow the water down, uh, but the storm will move on and the water never rose as much as it could because you were able to slow the water down. And that's basically as what it's illustrated in the bottom. So yet, this is to emphasize why, in our view, and, and what is now embraced by the state and the court, I mean, why the coast is so important. A simple way to say it is, uh, I love these help protect our cities, but we need our coast to protect our levels. All right, now next slide. Now, one big change that the state did undertake, uh, uh, Rose Katrina, was uh, this idea of looking at coastal restoration and flood protection before Katrina was handled by totally different agencies with the state. So basically you had, you know, people that are totally on different pages and might actually be working against each other, not intentionally, uh, but the next slide. Uh, what has happened is that after Katrina, the state merged those functions so that coastal restoration and flood protection are handled by one agency. And that is now the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, uh, who oversees the state master plan and the execution of the state master plan basically is kind of in charge of our coast. Uh, next slide. All right, here's a uh, model that was run after Katrina. And it's a little hard to reference yourself, but the, the blue area is toward the, the upper left, that's Lake Ponch Train, and where that border is, and kind of running down diagonally, that's the river. And the hot colors are representing higher surge levels, so that, that's higher water, and the cooler colors are lower. And what you see is that it's labeled peak surge, that's where the maximum surge occurred during Katrina. And it did not occur up at the levees, it occurred out in the marsh, and that's because the wetlands were out there slowing the water down. And look at Mississippi. Mississippi, look at very hot colors all the way in. And that's because the water, there was nothing to slow it down. The water, you know, Mississippi has a very abrupt coast. All that water just piled up right against the coast. As we lose our coast, the more we're going to be like Mississippi. And that water is going to be piling up against our levels. So that's why this illustrates, once again, why our coast is so important. Uh, next slide. Here's, here's a depiction of the land loss. 
Uh, this shows that the red is where, over basically a square mile, you get 100% loss of the coast. So you can see there's lots of hot spots. There's lots of the blobby areas, red areas, there. It's near 100% land loss. And that, that is one depiction. You will also imagine this is another depiction of kind of deterioration of our coast. Uh, next slide. Now, how did all this loss happen? And uh, you know, the, there's major things that happen during the time. Once again, we have the time scale on the uh, bottom axis. And those boxes represent major environmental impacts that occurred over, to our coast over time. The Mississippi River, that's when we started levying the river. And that's when we started cutting off the river and, and didn't allow the settling nutrients to feed the, the marsh and, and maintain the marsh and build the marsh. That happened a long time ago. The next, next uh, period is this log. Uh, unfortunately, uh, basically every virgin forest uh, in the state is log. Uh, you know, cypress, pine, everything. Uh, for us down here, the swamps help provide a lot of protection that day. So that was a big impact. But the next box is in the 30s of 1974. That's basically this, this period when there was all these canals in the dark. And a lot of that corresponds to the peak activity of oil and gas in coastal Louisiana. So that, that is another box, another uh, period of loss that added. We have these cumulative things that were occurring. And, and uh, so there, there's multiple factors that are contributing to our loss. Rolling gas canals are just one. Yes. Uh, okay. Next one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's get back. All right, what are some of the effects? I'm going to try and show you some of the, the, the more graphics. Uh, this is the pipeline map. Uh, so basically all those long gas fields scattered across the coast. The red lines are, are gas pipelines. The, the green lines are oil pipelines. Uh, pipelines often create canals too. So uh, they're different from the other kinds of canals I'll show you in a moment, but they, they tend to be you know, similar to characteristics. Uh, they're long open. Uh, open water areas that kind of just arbitrarily kind of cut across our coast. All right, next slide. All right, this is a more typical kind of pattern. Uh, and I'll show you uh, the zoom in, this will be a little clearer. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the data sets that have been generated for coastal Louisiana depicting coastal land loss over time. And the green areas here, you can see the time periods in the upper left. So you see the green period corresponds to the 30s to uh, late 50s. So that, a lot of that corresponds to when the oil and gas activity was occurring in Louisiana, a lot of canals were created. So if you see the green lines on the map here, uh, especially in this bottom here where you see this little branching pattern, that's a typical oil and gas field that you see uh, all these kinds of maps. And that is what's called a direct impact of the canals. That's, it's called direct because that's where they actually excavate the bar, the oil and gas become open water. We would take that material, put it on the edge of the canal, and that would be a small canal. And that doesn't become water, but it does convert what was wetlands to another habitat. So actually, that's additional loss. But this is basically what is often called the direct impact, where they actually dredged the marsh and made it into these open water canals as opposed to a emergent wetland marsh. Okay. Okay, there's a zoom in. Uh, you can see these various patterns, you know, obviously this kind of you know, natural features don't tend to be directly linear, so you can see these kind of, you know, wide angle types of canals, very linear. Uh, that's a typical pattern of long gas. You can see these other red, red patterns that are scattered about. That is more of uh, other processes. A lot of these are, are is what would be called shoreline road, and basically the waves are basically chewing away at the end of the marsh. And that's a, a typical pattern also. So you can look at these maps and begin to see discriminate what it may be related to oil and gas and to other, other processes. And that has been done by some major studies. Uh, one of those was on this data set was Shea Penland, who uh, was at New Orleans, passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. But uh, he, he was one of the first people to take this data and try to allocate the loss to various factors of uh, what caused that loss. Okay. Right, now this is the same area, if you recognize the same kind of ranching pattern, and all those little dots are all the gas wells. So basically you can see why they have those canals, it was to access locations where they could drill down. And 
One of the things that changed, though, is you see almost all the locations are in the canal. Uh, we now have, starting, well, starting in the 1970s, they can now directionally drill, or since the 70s. What that means is the surface location can be here, they can drill at an angle so that the bottom of the well, you know, maybe, maybe thousands of feet down, can be offset from the surface. That wasn't possible before the 1970s. If they wanted to drill another well just 100 feet away, they had to take the canal and it goes straight down. And that's why you see this kind of crazy, detailed canal, because that's where the technology was at that point. We now, with oil and gas regulations, force the companies uh, to directionally drill if all possible so they avoid dredging new canals. And in fact, a lot fewer canals are dredged since basically the 1980s in Louisiana. And next slide. Here, here's a little later image, once again, of the same era. And what you see is those pink areas that were looked so solid before, they don't look so solid here. And this is basically related to what some people would call the indirect loss. That basically, the canals affect the flow of the water around these canals, and it causes wetland loss even beyond the canal itself. And that is somewhat kind of a guilt by association, where they see this kind of amorphous kind of land change, the land loss, and they see it, they're closely associated with, associated with canals. Uh, there's a good chance, but you can't necessarily prove it, but it could very well be to, to the presence of those canals. All right, uh, this is a, a zoom out now, and then the, the old gas well I've been showing you is kind of in the upper top, uh, kind of a little bit off center to the left, the green and red. This is showing you where you see now these green and red clusters are all oil fields along this portion of the coast. It's a river running right down the hill. And you can see, if you look a little carefully, you can see each one of those clusters, you know, have their oil and gas canals, and, and some of them have uh, what appear to be larger areas of land loss associated with those areas. So that's the kind of patterns that, that we have with this here. The oil and gas is not uniformly distributed, but it's concentrated in certain pockets. That's where the oil and gas activity occurs, that's where the canals occur, and that's where we have these kind of effects on the weapons. All right, this is an area uh, uh, also along the river. Uh, it's a river on the, the left edge of the map. It's an area called Bohemian. And I want to make another point here about these patterns. You can see there's another, a couple of oil and gas fields. You can see the blue branching green patterns again. Which you can all recognize that now. Uh, but you see that there's very little other land loss in this area. This area is an area where the river is still allowed to overflow its banks, and what we see here is that we don't see the indirect effect of the canals. And that's, that's another story for another day, but go uh, ahead to the next slide. What I want to make is that this land loss work that has been done, there's two schools of work that have been done. One is by the Corps of Engineers, and that's the map that I just showed you. Go back for a moment. This is the data that the Corps interpreted land change by looking at maps and images and came up with that interpretation. There's another data set, this is actually more which is both now, it's done by the US Geological Survey. And they use satellite imagery and they use computers to make the interpretation, whereas the Corps actually did it manually. So the professional would sit in and actually make the interpretation and roll out where the land change occurred. Uh, the USGS uses computers and they try and verify it. I'm not trying to say uh, that's all bad, but as you might suspect, we end up with slightly different sets of information. Uh, next slide. And I'll show you just one example of that. Uh, this is the same area I showed you a moment ago. You can recognize the area on the map. That's the Corps of Engineers data. You can see those branching patterns. And if you look carefully, I'm going to walk over here and show you this. This is the same area as that green area right here. You can see on this data set by the USGS, and this is the most recent data that's been done by the USGS, they hardly map the canals at all. And that's because they use a different approach. They use satellite data, and that satellite data is coarser. It doesn't have as fine a picture of, of the earth. And so they're using data that is uh, what's available now, but it's frankly not as good. There's other benefits to it. But this is one of the pitfalls of, of when you look at this kind of data that uh, it's not black and white. You have different interpretations, different kinds of data that people can use. Um, but these are the two data sets that, that we have to work with at this point. Uh, All right, um, kind of getting wrapping up now. The, uh, the state master plan uh, 
approved in 2012 unanimously by the state legislature. We support the state master plan. It basically uses what we would call the multiple lines of fence. It doesn't try to say it's all about levies, it doesn't say it's all about diversions. It basically uses a multiple approach for restoration and flood protection, non-structural elevating housing. It uses kind of a full uh, uh, banquet of, of options that the multiple lines of fence tries to embrace. Uh, so we, we, we support the state master plan, and uh, regardless of, of any kind of legal activity, uh, next slide. Uh, here, here's basically trying to illustrate that. There's a multiple lines of defense illustration, and these are the various money allocations, that piece of the pie, to show you how they're using various techniques that are embraced by multiple lines of defense. Some of them are some of them are smart creations, some of them are ridges, here in islands. We think that's very powerful, and it basically is a model that we need to go forward. Not to say that this plan is perfect, it's a living document, but basically this idea that we can't use one approach to get where we need to be to that higher level of protection. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, in, uh, for the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation, we've got a similar kind of analysis, and we have embraced 10 areas of coastal restoration, which we think provide this, this kind of a line to defense. And basically, it's a coastal buffer as well as it's important ecologically. So these are what we call our, our contrary coastal lines of defense. Next slide. All right, just a conclusion slide here. This is the same graph I showed you at the beginning, uh, with just a little addition. Uh, basically, that red bar on the center, that's the crisis we're still in. Uh, basically, our coast, unfortunately, is still declining. We've had some levy improvements. I showed you how that basically is still below what we talk about, below what people believe that a city like New Orleans should have. We have a long way to go to try and improve it. Uh, we have things like the state master plan that embrace that largely. We have uh, the CORE's the LACPR plan, which embraces it also, although it's not funded. Um, and the thing we need to avoid though, is that that red dash line in the future doesn't decline again. So basically, we need to improve our system, but we need to do it in a way that's sustainable, and that's about having a sustainable coast. So we need to be restore our coast, but do it in a sustainable way, and not do things that are going to damage it like we did in the past, so that once we get up to that higher level of protection, that we can stay there in the future. Uh, thank you.